welcome to the Beach House 34 podcast. I'm your host, Christine Worth. Welcome to the new subscribers and welcome back to our devoted listeners. I want to thank Elena for taking the time to support this podcast by buying me a coffee. There's a link in the show notes below if you're interested in doing the same thing. Thank you so much, Elena. I appreciate your support so much. Thank you. Now, a really quick note, kind of on my side of things. For the past three days, we've been having some internet connection issues. As I record this, I'm hoping that all will go well and I'll be able to upload as usual on Tuesday. You never know, do you, how much you rely on the internet until you don't. It's been very intermittent and it'll be on for like 45 minutes and then it'll shut off and then turn back on again. So hopefully, knock on wood, I can get this all completed in one take. So with that said, let's get on to this episode. And what you'll hear in this episode is the rest of the direct appeal for Darley Routier's case. And in the event you've, you're visiting for the first time, this first began as a true crime episode, which then led into the trial transcript recordings. And we're now on the direct appeal. There's only a few more episodes to go before the true crime episodes begin again, and I'm still looking at some time in September to get back to those. Now, the links to the true crime episode that began this whole thing, as well as the entire playlist for the trial readings, can be found on the Beach House 34 podcast playlist on YouTube, and the links for those are below in the show notes. Now, this episode will be slightly longer than the others. And as I've done before, I'll do my best to summarize what's going on after each section. This is what they call the quote unquote points of errors. There's a lot of legal terms in this document. And not only does it help me to summarize and even understand what's happening, but I hope it helps you too. So with that said, let's begin with points of error number four and number five, because they're kind of bundled together. Before we start with points of error number four and number five, it's important to know that in this, these points of error, they refer to the name of Simmons. Now, in the previous episode, we learned that Simmons is the court reporter who had to redo the original court reporter's notes because they were so bad, they weren't able to be certified. So when this name comes up, you'll now know who they're referring to. Point of error number four. Appellant is entitled to a hearing which comports with due process on her objections to the completeness and accuracy of the reporter's record before it can be used to decide her appeal. And then point of error number five. Appellant is entitled to a Rule 34.6 hearing to settle the disputes about the reporter's record before it can be used to decide her appeal. If appellant has not established that it is impossible to produce a complete and accurate reporter's record for her appeal, this case must be remanded for a hearing on all of her objections to the new record that Simmons filed. The proceedings that the trial court conducted about these objections did not comply with any of the requirements of due process, and then it cites Texas Appeals 34.6 E2, and it goes on. The requirements of due process clearly apply to a hearing about the completeness and accuracy of the appellate record when the death penalty was imposed. Chessman versus Teats 354 U.S. 156 in 1957. The minimum requirements of due process include advance notice of issues to be resolved by the adversary process and an opportunity for the defendant to be heard, to examine the witnesses, to offer testimony, and to be represented by counsel. Those requirements of due process are codified in Rule 34.6 E2. The rule provides that the trial court must settle disputes about the accuracy of the reporter's record after notice and hearing. When a hearing is required by the Texas Code of Criminal Procedure, the defendant must be allowed to present live testimony and cross-examine the state's witnesses unless the code specifies that a paper hearing is permissible. 
there is no reason and no precedent for interpreting the word quote unquote hearing in Rule 34.6 differently. All of the requirements of due process and Rule 34.6 would be violated in this case if the proceedings that the trial court conducted were deemed sufficient to settle the disputes about the accuracy and completeness of the new record. Appellant was not notified in advance that any of those proceedings were held to resolve the disputes about the new record. Simmons completed her testimony about the new record before Appellant read that record and filed her objections to it. Appellant was not allowed to question Simmons before or after she read the new record and filed her objections to it. Appellant was not permitted to introduce any evidence about the new record or make an offer of proof. It would be an understatement to say that she was denied an opportunity to be heard. The truth is that she was blinded, gagged, restrained, ejected from the courthouse, and then locked out and ordered not to return. The time and money that the trial court invested to create the new record was not a substitute for a fair hearing on appellant's objections to it. And then it goes on to cite a court case, which says in Williams v. State, uh, Texas Criminal Appeal 1967, the court reporter who attended the trial died before he transcribed some of his stenographic notes and certified the record. The deceased reporter's uncertified partial transcript of the trial, his stenographic notes, and his uncertified backup audio tapes were given to a new reporter who produced and certified a new record. A hearing was conducted to resolve disputes about the new record. At the hearing, the new court reporter acknowledged that he did not compare the audio tapes to the stenographic notes. The new reporter was ordered to make that comparison before the hearing was completed and the record was settled. This court held that the new record was acceptable because the defendant, quote, certainly had his day in court upon settlement of the record, unquote. And then the direct appeal goes on. Appellant never had her day in court because Judge Francis refused to accurately transcribe Halsey's original paper stenographic notes, compare them to the audio tapes, and conduct a fair hearing to determine whether either version or the record entirely or partially conforms to what happened in the courtroom. This court should hold her appeal in abeyance and remand the case with instructions to conduct such a hearing if the record does not already show that her conviction must be reversed for the reasons stated in her other points of error. Further, in the event of a hearing, it may be, actually, it is probable, that there will be additional facts which will be established, which support appellant's points of error pertaining to the record. All right, let's do a quick recap. All right. Essentially here, they're talking about these big problems with the court transcripts, right, of what happened in the, the trial. And the appellant, which is Darley and her attorney, believes they should get a fair chance to point out the mistakes that were in this record before it's even used to decide anything in their appeal. They mentioned they weren't given a proper opportunity to do this. They couldn't ask questions. They couldn't show evidence. They couldn't even be present when the record of this was discussed. And essentially what I understand is that they're asking for this case to be sent back to another court for a proper discussion about this transcript issue unless the conviction, Darley's conviction, is already going to be overturned for other reasons. Point of error number six. The court violated former Texas criminal, I believe it's evidence, 613, when it refused to allow appellant's private investigator to testify about a prior inconsistent statement of the state's blood spatter expert. Point of error number seven. The court denied appellant due process when it refused to allow her private investigator to testify about a prior inconsistent statement of the state's blood spatter expert. Just to understand what the what this rule is that they're referring to, this is the Texas Criminal Evidence 613, which goes as follows, and this is what I've learned. 
is that this rule is about how lawyers can question witnesses in court, especially when they think the witness might be lying or biased. And here's essentially what it says. If a lawyer thinks that a witness is saying something different from what they said before, they can bring it up. But they have to tell the witness what they supposedly said earlier and when they said it. The witness also gets a chance to explain or deny what they supposedly had said. If the witness admits that they said something different before, that's usually the end of it. If they don't admit it, the lawyer might be able to bring in other evidence to prove it. Lawyers can also ask questions to show that a witness might be biased or have a reason to not tell the truth. And before showing evidence that a witness might be biased, the lawyer has to give the witness a chance to explain. Now, these rules evidently don't apply when they're talking about a witness's past crimes. Essentially, this whole rule just helps to make sure that the questioning in court is fair, but it also allows the lawyers to challenge witnesses who they believe might not be telling the whole truth. And it goes on. In the interest of brevity, appellant will argue points of errors number six and seven together. The trial court denied appellant due process and violated Texas Criminal 613 when it refused to allow her private investigator, Lloyd Harrell, to testify about the exculpatory opinion that the state's bloodstain pattern expert, Tom Bevel, related to him during a pre-trial interview. Harrell was in the courtroom when Bevel testified, but it was an abuse of discretion to suppress Harrell's testimony on that ground because appellant could not have anticipated that Bevel would contradict what he said to Harrell before the trial. The court has adopted a two-pronged test to determine whether a defense witness's testimony should be admitted in spite of his presence in the courtroom after the state invoked the rule. It is an abuse of discretion to exclude the testimony of the witness if, one, the defendant and his counsel did not consent to, procure, connive, or have knowledge of the presence of a subpoenaed or potential witness in the courtroom after the rule was invoked. And two, the testimony of the witness is crucial to the defense. Tom Bevel testified on direct examination that he talked to three of her lawyers and, quote unquote, an investigator, Lloyd Harrell, on December 30th, 1996, in Oklahoma City for four hours. Harrell was in the courtroom assisting appellant's attorneys when Bevel was on the stand. Bevel told the jury that there were four minuscule cast-off bloodstains on the front of the t-shirt that appellant was wearing when she and her children were <laughs> Bevel believed that the most likely explanation for the four stains was that the blood was cast off of the knife when appellant was <laughs> her sons. Two of these bloodstains were made with appellant's blood and the blood of Damon. The other two stains were made with her blood and Devon's. And here there is a citation, and this is citation number 30, and this is what this says. Stain LS1 near the left shoulder contained Darley's and Damon's blood. Stain LS3 near the left shoulder contained Darley's and Devon's blood. Stain T9 near the right shoulder contained Darley's and Damon's blood and stain 10 near the right shoulder contained Darley's and Devon's blood. And then it goes on. Bevel acknowledged that appellant had to be cut before she <laughs> her sons if she cast her blood from the knife to her shirt when she was stabbing them. However, Bevel claimed that appellant could have stabbed both children before she cut herself and cast drops of her blood on top of drops of their blood. Bevel conceded that one cast off stain near the left front shoulder of the shirt that he designated as LS1 was made with a single drop of appellant's blood and Damon's blood mixed together. But he insisted that each of the other three stains could have been made by a tiny drop of appellant's blood that landed on top of a tiny drop of a child's blood 
with such accuracy that he could not determine whether there were one or two stains in each place on the shirt. Counsel tried to impeach and rebut this part of Bevel's testimony by confronting him with a prior inconsistent statement that he made to Harrell and Appellant's lawyers in Oklahoma. And it goes on with a transcript of what was said. Question. Now, were you also asked a hypothetical about the of Damon in that same regard with respect to the blood, the mixed blood, when we were in Oklahoma? Did you tell us that was mixed blood? The answer, I told you there was some mixed blood. I don't know if we specifically addressed that stain. I don't recall. Well, you told us that in your judgment that was mixed blood in one stain. I don't recall specifically stating that it was one stain. Now, which one are we referring to here? I'm talking about these. I'm talking to all four of them on the front of the shirt, all four of them mixed. The only one that I can say is really consistent without hesitation is the one that is up in this area here, which is going to be LS1. You are talking about the highest one on the left shoulder? That is correct. Okay. But you didn't tell us when we were up there that you thought all of those others were a stain that was mixed before it hit the shirt? I don't believe so. And then the appeal continues. Lead counsel Doug Mulder asked the court to allow Harold to testify about the prior inconsistent statement that Bevel denied making, in spite of the fact that Harold was in the courtroom during Bevel's testimony because Bevel's memory of what he said to him and Harold, quote, was less than accurate, unquote. The court refused to allow Harold to take the stand in front of the jury and invited counsel to make a bill of exception. Co-counsel John Hagler reminded the court that Rule 613 is not a, quote, per se exclusionary rule, unquote, and the court's discretion to suppress the testimony of an unsequestered witness depends on his testimony and whether the defendant was responsible for his presence in the courtroom. Hagler asserted that the defense team, quote, had no idea what Bevel was going to testify to, unquote. He argued that Harold's testimony was crucial. Co-counsel Preston Douglas argued, quote, you can't anticipate an expert who is a police officer is going to say something different from the interviews. The only way you can respond to it then is to have a witness come up and say directly contrary to what he told us in Oklahoma, unquote. The court still refused to allow Harold to testify in front of the jury. Harold testified on the bill of exception that he was employed a special agent for the FBI from 1965 until 1989 and worked as a private investigator after he left the Bureau. Harrell interviewed Bevel in Oklahoma with three of Appellant's lawyers on December 30, 1996. They questioned Bevel about bloodstains on Appellant's t-shirt. Harrell swore that Bevel's trial testimony about those bloodstains was materially different from the opinion that he expressed in his interview. Bevel told them that he selected the bloodstains on Appellant's t-shirt that were to be DNA tested. Bevel stated, that the most important selection criteria was whether one axis of it was longer than the other one, because that enabled him to determine the direction that the blood was traveling when it landed on the t-shirt. Bevel made every effort to select stains that were made with a single drop of blood because overlapping multiple stains can cloud the issue of directionality. When Appellant's attorneys and Harrell questioned Bevel about this particular issue, Bevel said that the cast-off stains on the shirt contained mixtures of Darley's blood and the blood of her children. Harrell heard Bevel testify that the individual cast-off stains that he sampled may not have been made by a mixture of appellant's blood and a child's blood because each stain could be the result of, quote, two separate occurrences causing that particular single stain, unquote. When Harrell was asked, whether there was a material discrepancy between that part of Bevel's testimony and the opinion that Bevel gave them in Oklahoma, Harrell responded, Absolutely, for this reason. In Oklahoma City, he was asked at least twice 
Does this mean that each of those stains, the knife tip, had to contain the blood of Darley and the blood of one of her children? His response to that answer was yes. Harold concluded that Bevel contradicted that opinion on the witness stand. Counsel renewed their argument about the admissibility of Harold's testimony after they made their bill. They informed the court that they had no knowledge before the trial that Harold would be a witness. They explained that they did not know that Bevel was going to testify that any of the cast-off stains were made with drops of appellant's blood and a child's blood that hit the same spot on her shirt. They contended that Harold's testimony was admissible under the federal constitution as well as Rule 613. The court ruled again that Harold could not testify. Appellant clearly satisfied the first prong of the Webb versus State test for an abuse of discretion and a violation of due process because she and her attorneys could not have anticipated that it would be necessary to have Harold testify about Bevel's prior inconsistent statement. A defendant and her lawyers cannot be faulted for not sequestering a witness who was called to contradict the testimony of a prosecution witness if they did not know when the rule was invoked what the prosecution witness was going to say on the stand. And then there's a, another citation, citation number 31, which says, The unsworn statements that appellant's attorneys made about their failure to anticipate that they would need to have Harold testify about Bevel's prior inconsistent statement must be accepted as true because the court and the prosecutor did not dispute them. The appeal then goes on. This exception to the rule of sequestration frequently applies in cases like this one where a prosecution witness unexpectedly contradicted a statement that he made to a defense investigator during a pre-trial interview. The primary purpose of conducting such an interview is to learn what the witness will say on the stand. There is always a possibility that the witness will recant or forget what he told the investigator but it was reasonable for appellant's counsel to believe that a very experienced expert witness like Bevel would not directly contradict an opinion about a crucial issue that he gave their investigator in a high-profile capital murder case because he should have known that it could damage his credibility and reputation. Appellant satisfied the second prong of the Webb versus State test for an abuse of discretion and a violation of due process because Harold's testimony was strong, absolutely crucial to her defense, and not cumulative. Harold was a very credible witness because of his experience and training as an FBI agent. In cross-examination, the prosecutor established no basis to disbelieve Harold. There was no realistic possibility that he was mistaken about Bevel's answer to a pointed question about a material issue because Bevel repeated it at least twice. The opinion about the cast-off bloodstains on Appellant's shirt that Bevel gave to Harold and Appellant's lawyers was the essential first link in a chain of circumstantial evidence that would have established that an intruder must have carried a sock that had the blood of both of her children on it out of the house and left it on the sidewalk. Bevel conceded that Appellant had to be cut before both of her children if two drops that contained a mixture of her blood and Damon's blood, and two drops that contained a mixture of her blood and Devin's blood, were cast off the knife to her shirt when she was them. Appellant would have left an obvious trail of blood in the garage and on the sidewalk if she cut herself first, then both children and finally carried the sock with their blood on it to the trash barrel in the alley because her wounds bled profusely wherever she went. The police meticulously searched the entire route, and they did not find a drop of blood there. Bevel escaped from that trap by testifying that drops of her appellant's blood could have landed on top of cast-off stains of her children's blood on her shirt. This meant that she could have the boys first, carried the sock with their blood on it to the alley, and then cut herself without bleeding outside of the house. And here is a citation, citation number 33, which says, The one cast-off stain that was definitely made by a single mixed drop of Appellant's blood and Damon's blood did not even establish 
that she must have been cut before Damon because it could have been cast off the knife to her shirt when she cut herself with the knife that she used to cut him. That hypothesis could not be stretched to explain how she could have both children before she cut herself if the four cast-off stains on her shirt were each made with a single drop of her blood and a child's blood. None of the stains would have been made with a single mixed drop of her blood and the blood of the first child who was because that child's blood would have been wiped off the knife or mixed with the blood of the second child when the blade was repeatedly inserted into him. And the appeal goes on. The theory that an intruder must have carried the sock out of the house would have been very strong if the jury had believed that appellant was before the children because there was no conceivable reason for appellant to do it if she was guilty. Bevel conceded that appellant would not have left the sock with a barely visible amount of blood on it a few houses away from the scene of the crime if she was smart enough to plant it as a false clue because the police might have overlooked it there. The person who left the sock in plain view next to an open sewer duct and a trash barrel that would have made excellent hiding places for it was obviously not trying to conceal incriminating evidence from the police. The state's theory that appellant used the sock like a glove to keep her fingerprints off of the murder weapon when she stabbed the children and tried to hide it in the alley before she stabbed herself with her bare hands defies common sense because her prints would have gotten on the weapon when she inflicted her own wounds. Appellant also had no time to inflict her own injuries and take the sock out of the house after the children were stabbed. The state's pathologist testified that Damon could not have lived more than nine minutes after his last stab wound was inflicted. Appellant did not cut herself or carry the sock out of the house during her tape-recorded 5 minute and 44 second telephone conversation with the 911 operator after Damon was And there's another citation, citation number 34, which says, This nine-minute survival period is almost unreasonably generous to the state. The medical examiner testified that it was, quote, conceivably a little longer, unquote, than five minutes. When she was asked whether the boy could have survived for eight or nine minutes, she replied, quote, unquote, you can't tell. The appeal then continues. She also did not cut herself and transport the sock to the alley in the minute and 10 seconds that must have elapsed between arrival of Officer Walling at the end of that tape recording and the time that a paramedic saw Damon take his last breath because officers Waddell and Walling and her husband were with her. And there's another citation, citation number 35, which says Darren was with the appellant during the entire conversation and officer Waddell was there for a substantial part of it. And another citation, which is citation number 36, which says, this figure is also generous to the state. The paramedics arrived with Walling, but he testified they had to wait outside for one or two minutes while he and Waddell searched every room of the two-story house to make sure that the intruder was not hiding there. At least 10 seconds must have elapsed between the time that Walling invited the paramedics to enter the house and Damon's death. The appeal then continues. This would have left only two minutes and six seconds for her to leave the house with the sock wearing nothing but a nightshirt, run on concrete in her bare feet to the back gate, kick the broken gate open with her bare foot, run the length of three houses, drop the sock next to the trash barrel, return to the back gate by the same route, close the back gate and enter the house, pick up the butcher knife in her right hand, cut her throat, shoulder, and cheek without turning on a light, switch the knife to her left hand, and cut her right forearm and fingers of her right hand, put the knife with her blood on it down on the carpet near the couch, move the knife to the kitchen counter, turn on the kitchen light switch with a bloody hand, rush to the utility room, and touch the door to the garage with a bloody hand, break a wine glass so that pieces of it landed on top of her blood, grab the vacuum cleaner with a bloody hand, 
roll it through her blood in the kitchen, lift it off the floor and roll it through her blood again, knock the vacuum over on top of her blood and the broken glass, scream for Darren and wait for him to rush downstairs, pick up the telephone and dial 911. It was not necessary for the jury to decide whether appellant could have performed all of these feats in 126 seconds like a genius killer in a pulp murder mystery. Bevel closed that small window of opportunity completely by testifying that several minutes elapsed between the time that appellant bled on the kitchen floor and rolled the vacuum through her own blood. And there's another citation, citation number 37, which says, Appellant's testimony and written statement were consistent with the timeline. She only had to follow the intruder to the utility room, turn on the kitchen light, pick up the knife, put it on the counter, return to the family room where she saw the bodies, go to the entrance hallway, scream for Darren, wait for him to come down the stairs and call 911 between after Damon was There was a two minute and six second window of opportunity for her to do these things because a paramedic or police officer could have rolled the vacuum through her blood in the kitchen several minutes after she bled there. The appeal then continues. The compelling evidence that appellant did not deposit the sock in the alley did not make Harold's testimony about Bevel's prior inconsistent statement cumulative or unimportant. The jurors would have been more inclined to believe appellant did not carry the sock down the alley if Harold had testified because there was other evidence that strongly supported the hypothesis. Bevel's prior inconsistent statement to Harold cannot be dismissed as mere impeachment material. The prior inconsistent statement was not only admissible for the limited purpose of impeaching Bevel's credibility under the former Texas Criminal Evidence 612, but the expert opinion that Bevel gave to Harrell and Appellant's lawyers was also admissible as substantive evidence under the rule of optional completeness because the state opened the door to it. The state did not have to introduce part of the contents of Bevel's conversation with counsel and Harrell to open the door to the substantive use of that evidence under Rule 107. And then it goes on to talk about a different case, which says Streff versus State as part of their example. And it says, in Streff versus State, a defendant opened the door to an inadmissible videotaped statement that a witness made to a police officer by referring to the fact that the statement was made during his cross-examination of the officer and suggesting with a question that the officer was hiding evidence. The defendant did not question the officer about the contents of the tape, but it was admissible under the rule of optional completeness because he suggested that it would help his case. The same principle applies here. The jurors probably would have concluded that the four-hour interrogation of Bevel by a tag team of three defense lawyers and their investigator did not yield a scintilla of evidence that was helpful to the appellant if her attorneys chose not to share any part of the conversation with them. In fact, the prosecutor indirectly drove that point home to the jurors in his summation when he criticized counsel for not presenting the testimony of a defense blood spatter expert who had inspected Darley's t-shirt to discredit Bevel's opinion. Quote, it speaks volumes to you sometimes, what you don't see and hear, and it speaks volumes in this case with regards to that t-shirt, unquote. The exclusion of Harold's testimony was not harmless. The error is subject to the test for harmless constitutional error because it was a violation of due process as well as a violation of Rule 613. The suppression of Harold's non-cumulative testimony about a crucial issue must have contributed to the verdict. In fact, the error would be reversible under Rule 44.2b, even if it was not of constitutional magnitude because it affected appellant's substantial right to present her defense. The state's evidence was not strong enough to make the erroneous exclusion of Bevel's prior inconsistent statement to Harrell harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. The state's theory 
was that an upper middle class mom who poetically expressed sincere love for all of her children in her private diary when she had no motive to lie, woke up in the middle of the night, slaughtered two of them, and nearly killed herself with a butcher knife that was bigger than the one that Norman Bates used to kill his mother in Psycho because she was depressed about a new baby whom she did not try to harm and then danced a barefoot tango in her own blood with a vacuum cleaner. She was supposed to be smart enough to stage a struggle by planting false clues, but dumb enough to tell the police an incredible tale about sleeping through her own stabbing that did not refer to any of those clues two days after she gave them a plausible statement about struggling with the intruder. Charles Lynch's opinion that rubber and fiber glass debris from the cut window screen was on the blade of a bread knife in the butcher block was the most incriminating evidence because it meant that someone in the house staged the break-in, but there were substantial reasons for the jury to doubt whether it was true. Officer Charles Hamilton could have accidentally contaminated the bread knife with debris from the window screen by dusting the blade with the same fingerprint powder brush that he used to dust the frame of the screen and the window. Hamilton testified that he thoroughly dusted the area around the cut screen with his brush before he did anything else. A retired veteran homicide detective, James Cron, who knew how to preserve physical evidence at a crime scene, warned the Rowlett police not to dust things that might have trace evidence on them for fingerprints before Lynch had a chance to collect it. But Hamilton did not follow his advice. Lynch claimed that the bread knife was never fingerprinted, but there was a grayish black material, carbon black, on the blade and handle of the knife in a photograph that the state introduced without explaining how or when it got there. Hamilton could have applied that fingerprint powder at the crime scene with a brush that was contaminated with rubber and fiberglass after he dusted the area around the cut screen. In addition, Lynch's credibility was tarnished because a DNA test revealed that he mistakenly matched a police officer's hair in the frame of the cut screen with a known sample of appellant's hair. And there is a citation, citation number 40, which says, Hamilton processed the kitchen counter where the knife rack was located for fingerprints, but he could not remember what specific items on the counter he dusted. And then it goes back. The remainder of the state's highly circumstantial evidence only proved the possible or probable existence of equivocally incriminating facts. If Bevel's opinion about the bloodstain from the murder weapon on the carpet was correct, the intruder could have put the bloody knife on the carpet when appellant was unconscious because he had to wipe blood off of his face or pick up something that he dropped. The intruder could have dropped the knife on a throw rug near the entrance to the utility room or a black cap near the washer and dryer without leaving a blood spatter on the linoleum floor. Both of those fabric items were stained with appellant's blood. The evidence did not explain exactly how the wine glass fell off of the wine rack, how the vacuum cleaner ended up in the kitchen on top of appellant's bloody footprints, or how difficult it would have been for an intruder to close the back gate. But these little mysteries were not proof that appellant brutally murdered her own children. In fact, the officer who collected most of the evidence alleged that, quote-unquote, someone has tampered with the crime scene. There were also conflicting testimony about the bruises on Appellant's arms and the knife holes in her shirt that did not correspond to her wounds, but she was entitled to the benefit of the doubt about those issues. One only needs to review Skelton v. State Texas Criminal Appeal 1989 to appreciate the significance of unscrutinized expert testimony. This court reversed a death sentence and entered a judgment of acquittal after closely examining the testimony of an expert who the state argued had tied the accused to the offense. In Appellant's case, had Harrell been allowed to testify, the state's theory of the offense would have been devastated while the defense theory was simultaneously bolstered. In sum, the, quote, 
due administration of justice cannot be preserved and maintained by sustaining the trial court's ruling, unquote, to exclude the testimony of a crucial witness like Harrell just because he was not sequestered, especially, quote, in view of the fact that the extreme penalty of death was assessed, unquote. Appellant's conviction must therefore be reversed. Okay, so let's do a really quick recap on this section. This was actually pretty long. It had points of error number six and seven. Now, number six says that the court broke the rule of Texas criminal evidence, Rule 613, when it didn't let Darley's private investigator, who used to be an FBI agent, testify about something different than what the state's blood spatter expert had previously said in trial. Point of error number seven was the fact that the court denied the fair treatment or due process when it didn't allow this investigator, Harold, to testify about this blood expert's earlier statement. So obviously the main issue here is the testimony from Bevel, right? The defendant's team said that Bevel said one thing to them with all of the attorneys and with her private investigator available, I think it was December 30th of 1996, that they all had this discussion and Bevel told them something different than what he said in court. And they, Darley's team, wanted the investigator, Harold, to tell the jury about this, but the judge just wouldn't allow it. The appeal, this document, argues that this was unfair and it broke the rules. It says that this testimony was crucial because it could have supported the idea that someone else committed the crime. It goes into a lot of detail about timelines and blood evidence and why this testimony is so important. But, you know, basically they're saying that without this information, the jury didn't get the full picture. And this might have led to the wrong verdict in a case where obviously someone's life is at stake. Next, we have actually three points of error all in a row. Point of error number eight. The trial court violated appellant's right to counsel by using an unrecorded ex parte communication from an unnamed person that occurred when her lawyer was not there as the only basis for discharging a sworn juror. Point of error number nine. The trial court violated appellant's right to be present during an unrecorded ex parte communication with an unnamed person that provided the only basis for the trial court's finding that a sworn juror was disabled. Point of error number 10. The trial court abused its discretion under Texas Criminal Procedure 36.29 by replacing a sworn juror when there was no evidence in the record to show that she was disabled. And just to explain what this Texas Code of Criminal Procedure, this 36.29 is, is that it's a law that helps to make sure that trials don't have to start all over just because one juror can't continue. And this is essentially about what happens if a juror can't finish a trial. And in serious felony cases, which obviously that's what this case is, if a juror gets sick, dies, or can't continue for some reason, the trial can keep going as long as there are at least nine jurors left. For less serious cases, if a juror drops out, the trial can continue if both the prosecution and the defense agree. If there is a backup juror available, they might replace the one who left. A juror is actually considered unable to continue if they can't do their job properly for any reason. So that's what they're referring to here with this Texas criminal, Texas Code of Criminal Procedure in 36.29. So let's continue. The Appeal says, in the interest of brevity, appellant will argue points of errors 8, 9, and 10 together. The trial court committed three errors when it accepted an unsworn, unrecorded ex parte communication from an unnamed person about a juror's illness and replaced her without conducting any sort of judicial inquiry into the matter. Appellant had a right to be present with her lawyer when the court received the evidence of the juror's disability. The court also had no discretion under Texas Criminal Code 36.29 
to find that the juror was disabled because there was no evidence of the fact in that record when she was discharged. On January 16th, 1997, at 9 a.m., when the prosecution was about to resume the presentation of its case in chief, the trial court announced, quote, All right, juror number 12 is ill and disabled and unable to continue fully to perform her function as a juror, so I am replacing her with alternate number one, unquote. Counsel acknowledged that the trial court has discretion under 36.29 to replace a juror if she, quote unquote, in fact becomes disabled. But he objected that the case should be adjourned for 24 hours, quote unquote, for the court to determine whether this juror is truly and in fact disabled as provided under the statute. He pointed out that she attended all of the proceedings during the first week and a half of the trial. The trial court responded, quote, This juror had the flu yesterday, struggled to come down, continues to have it today, and is bedridden, so I am replacing her, unquote. The court violated appellant's right to counsel by engaging in an unrecorded ex parte communication about the discharged juror's disability when her lawyer was not there. A trial judge can engage in a preliminary ex parte communication with a juror to determine whether a formal judicial inquiry into her ability to serve is required without violating the defendant's right to counsel. But counsel must be present during any colloquy that the court considered as evidence of the juror's disability. Here, the court's finding of disability was entirely based on a conversation with an unnamed individual that occurred when counsel was not there to question her. Counsel did not have a reasonable opportunity to be heard on the matter in court after the unrecorded ex parte conversation took place because he did not know what was said. The trial court violated appellant's right to be present at a critical stage of her trial when it engaged in ex parte communication about the juror's disability. The risk of actual prejudice was quite substantial. The juror might have lied to the judge about her illness because she wanted to avoid the trauma or inconvenience of jury service in a lengthy capital trial. The report of her sickness may have been exaggerated by mistake or design as it was passed from the juror to a spouse who called the judge. Further questioning of the juror by or at the suggestion of counsel may have established that the juror would have recovered from her illness more quickly than the judge believed. These concerns would not exist if the juror's disability was established with competent evidence on the record in a judicial proceeding in the presence of the defendant and her lawyer. The trial court also abused its discretion under 36.29 to replace a disabled juror with an alternate because there was no evidence that juror number 12 was disabled. A finding of disability under 36.29 must be supported by sufficient evidence in the record. And while throughout this entire appeal, there's several references to other cases that have occurred in the past that have a similar, have a similarity to what's going on in this particular argument that they're making or this particular point of error. But there's one in particular that they definitely make reference to in here. And it's called In State versus Layman, Wisconsin, 1982. The Wisconsin Supreme Court held that it was an abuse of discretion for a trial judge to discharge a juror who claimed that she was ill in circumstances that closely resemble the facts of this case. And it goes on to say, The record is totally devoid of any indication of how or when the circuit court became aware of the juror's illness. Whether it was the circuit judge, the clerk of the court, or the bailiff who discharged the juror, or whether the juror was questioned to determine how ill she was, or whether she might be able to rejoin the jury within a short time. Moreover, neither the defendant nor the state was given an opportunity to be present when the ill juror was discharged. We cannot determine from the record in the instant case whether or not the circuit court exercised its discretion to discharge the juror or on what basis the court reached its decision. Under these circumstances, we can reach only one conclusion, 
namely that the circuit court abused its discretion in discharging the regular juror in the instant case. And then the appeal continues. The trial court did not cure the problem by putting two unauthenticated letters from doctors in the record on the day after juror number 12 was discharged. It was too late for the court to receive evidence of the juror's disability and the unauthenticated letters were not competent evidence of that fact in any event. The court commented that one of the letters was, quote, obviously from a physician, unquote, because, quote, no one can read it, unquote. But that humorous, unsworn remark was not a substitute for authentication of the document. There was a colorable question about authenticity of the letters because they were signed by different doctors who disagreed on the juror's illness. One physician recommended that the juror should be temporarily excused from her duties until further notice because she had bronchitis. The other doctor asked the court to release her from jury service because she had the flu. It is impossible to exclude the possibility that the juror forged the letters or persuaded a friendly physician to provide the proverbial quote-unquote doctor's note because she did not want to perform an unpleasant, time-consuming civic duty. It's not really even clear which, quote, courts number one, unquote, in the record was being referred to in the trial court's statement about, quote, the Xerox from the physician, unquote. This is because there are two such exhibits referencing the excused juror, one of which is dated but not file marked of 11797, while the other is undated and not file marked S.EX.1, which I assume to mean States Exhibit 1, maybe. It goes on. The violation of 36.29 cannot be harmless under Texas 44.2 because it affected a substantial right and it is impossible to determine from the record whether the discharged juror would have rendered a different verdict on guilt or punishment than the one who replaced her. This court held in Jones v. State in 1998 that the erroneous disqualification of a prospective juror was harmless under Rule 44.2b because the defendant had no right to have that particular juror serve, but that rationale for disregarding error does not apply here. Appellant had a, quote, valued right to have her trial completed by a particular tribunal, unquote, after the jury was sworn and the trial began. Appellant's conviction must therefore be reversed. Okay, so let's recap this section, this point of error number eight, nine, and 10. Okay, first of all, point of error number eight says that the court violated Darley's right to have a lawyer present when the court used information from a private conversation about a juror's illness in order to dismiss that juror from their duties. Point of error number nine was that the court violated Darley's right to be present during this private conversation about the juror's illness. And point of error number 10 was the court made a mistake by replacing another juror when there just simply wasn't enough evidence to show that the one who said she was sick couldn't continue. The defense is essentially arguing that the judge made three big mistakes. First of all, the judge had this private conversation about this sick juror without Darley or her lawyer present. Second, the defendant wasn't allowed, Darley, wasn't allowed to be there for this conversation, which is against the rules. And third, they say that there wasn't enough proof that the juror was too sick to continue. And this whole portion of the appeal argues that these mistakes, they were serious because they affected Darley's right to a fair trial and simply state that it's impossible to know that if this change in jurors at that point in time affected the eventual outcome of the trial. And essentially, they're asking for a new trial, I believe, because of these errors. Point of error number 11. The trial court violated Texas Code 36.27 by providing the jury with an inaccurate transcript of a crucial part of Darren Routier's testimony when appellant was not present. Point of error number 12. 
The trial court violated Texas Code 33.03 by providing the jury with an inaccurate transcript of a crucial part of Darren Ruchier's testimony when appellant was not present. And point of error number 13. The trial court violated appellant's due process right to be present at a critical stage of her trial by providing the jury with an inaccurate transcript of a crucial part of her husband's testimony when she was not present. And it goes on. In the interest of brevity, appellant will argue points of error numbers 11, 12, and 13 together. The trial court violated appellant's statutory and constitutional right to be present at a critical stage of her trial by providing an inaccurate transcript of Darren Routier's testimony about a crucial issue to the jury when she was not present. The Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment requires the defendant's presence at any stage of her trial when her presence has a reasonably substantial relationship to her ability to defend herself. Texas Criminal Code 33.03 requires the defendant's presence at every stage of her trial. Texas Criminal Procedure 36.27 provides that the trial judge, quote, shall use reasonable diligence to secure the presence of the defendant and his counsel, unquote, when it receives a communication from the jury and prohibits the judge from responding to a question from the jury when the defendant and her lawyer are not there unless, quote, he is unable to secure, unquote, their presence. In the present case, the court received a note from the jury that asked, quote, did Darren lock the utility room door before he went to bed, unquote. The court gave the jury a written instruction that they could not rehear part of a witness's testimony unless they certified that they disagreed about what he said. The jury sent the court another note, which stated, quote, Some of us remember Darren saying that he did not lock the door from the utility room to the garage before he went to bed, 6596. The rest of us remember that Darren said he locked this door, unquote. The court read the jury's question to the prosecutor and counsel in chambers and informed them that the court reporter had, quote, unquote, looked that up. The court asked the attorneys whether they had any objection to, quote-unquote, the reply, which consisted of three pages of Darren Routier's testimony on cross-examination. The prosecutor and counsel did not object, and then the court stated, quote, just for the record purposes, Ms. Darley Lynn Routier is not here for this hearing, unquote. The court asked counsel, quote, do you wish to waive her presence, unquote and her counsel responded that he did. The court then answered the jury's note by sending the three pages of Darren Routier's testimony to the jury. Appellant had a right, under 33.03, to be present when the court responded to the jury's request for this testimony because it was part of her trial. Appellant also had a constitutional right to be present at that critical stage, because it had a reasonably substantial relationship to her ability to defend herself. The testimony that the jurors disagreed about, quote, did not relate to trivial and substantial matters, but involved vital issues in this case, unquote. Appellant and the children could not have been attacked by an intruder, as she testified, if Darren Routier locked the door from the utility room to the garage because there was no sign of a forced entry at that point. There are numerous discrepancies between the transcript of that crucial part of Darren's testimony that the jury received and the reporter's record of the same testimony that appellant did not have an opportunity to correct. Appellant probably had a greater ability than her lawyers to recognize these mistakes in a transcript of her own husband's testimony about locking doors and windows in the house where they lived because she knew the witness and the facts. The violation of appellant's constitutional right to be present at this critical stage of her trial was not harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. This is especially true when the court gave the jury inaccurate information about a material issue in the defendant's absence as happened here. The trial courts also violated 36.27 by responding to the jury's request for this testimony without making an effort to secure appellant's presence. After all, 
she wasn't on bond, counsel did not procedurally default the claim by waiving appellant's presence because, quote, this court has held in many cases that the presence of the accused cannot be waived by the attorney, unquote. In White v. State, the court held that counsel could not waive the defendant's right under former Article, I believe, 679 of the Code of Criminal Procedure to be present when it responded to a question from the jury, even though counsel promised not to raise the issue on appeal. The reasoning of that case applies with equal force to 36.27 because, quote, these are mandatory provisions that should be strictly adhered to, unquote. In Smith v. State, Texas Criminal 1971, the court held that a formal written bill of exception reflecting the defendant's absence when the court answered a communication from the jury was not sufficient to establish that there was a violation of his right to be present under 38.27 because the bill did not show that he, quote, did not expressly waive the reading of the jury's note and the court's answer in open court and out of her presence, unquote. This case is distinguishable from Smith v. State because the trial court solicited and accepted a recorded waiver of appellant's presence from her attorney. There would have been no reason for the trial court to take that action if appellant made an unrecorded personal express waiver of her right to be there. The violation of 36.27 cannot be disregarded under Texas 44.2b as an error that did not affect a substantial right because the, quote, statutory requirement is not mandatory, unquote. And then they say Edwards versus State 27, and it is not possible to determine its likely impact on the verdict. Appellant's conviction must be reversed. All right, so let's recap points of errors number 11, 12, and 13. So number 11 is that the court broke Texas, the rule, Texas Code 36.27, by giving the jury a, an inaccurate transcript of important testimony, meaning Darren's testimony, when the defendant wasn't there. Point of error number 12 is that the court broke another rule, which is Texas Code 33.03, .03, by doing the same thing, giving the jury an inaccurate transcript when Darley wasn't present. And then point of error number 13 is that the court violated Darley's right to a fair trial in other words, due process, by giving the jury this inaccurate transcript of crucial testimony without Darley being there. So what the appeal says is that they say that first, the court gave the jury this inaccurate transcript of important testimony from Darren. Second, this happened when Darley wasn't in the courtroom. And third, they argue that this violated Darley's right to a fair trial. And this testimony was about whether the door from the, that led from the garage into the utility room, whether or not Darren had locked that or he had not locked that. And part of the argument is that Darley should have been there to catch any mistakes that were actually in the transcript. And they argue also that even though Darley's lawyer said it was okay to do this without her there, that still wasn't enough that Darley herself had to agree to this. Now, this appeal team believes that these mistakes were serious enough that they could have affected the outcome of the trial, especially in this case. And they're asking, again, for a new trial because of these errors. Point of error 14. And this is the final point of error for the direct appeal. And point of error number 14 states, the trial court erred in refusing to rule on appellant's formal bill of exception. And it goes on. On September 25th, 2000, appellant filed her defendant's formal bill of exception. Number one, Texas 33.2 mandates that a court, upon presentation of a formal bill of exception, set the matter for a hearing unless the parties agree to the bill. The bill must be, quote unquote, presented to the court for it to have a duty to comply with Rule 33.2. Appellant's bill set forth that a hearing had been scheduled for September 8, 2000, on appellant's written objections to the appellate record in this cause, together with certain other facts not then appearing in the record. The procedure set forth in Rule 33.2 
is replete with mandatory language, quote unquote, must, compelling the court's conduct when presented with a formal bill. The setting of the hearing and the cancellation of the same being potentially necessary for preservation of error purposes of appellant's multiple complaints in this appeal about the legality and accuracy of the reporter's record. The cause should be remanded to the trial court for full compliance with the procedure required by Rule 33.2. And then the final portion of this says prayer. For the reasons stated, appellant prays that the judgment of conviction be reversed and the cause remanded for a new trial and, as appropriate, that this court order further hearings in the trial court as requested herein. And it's signed respectfully submitted by J. Stephen Cooper, counsel for appellant for Darley. Okay, so let's recap the final point of error, number 14, which essentially says that the court made a mistake by not making a decision on Darley's formal bill of exception. And this bill of exception was a way to add information to the court record that wasn't originally included. According to the rules, when this happens, The court must schedule a hearing about it unless both sides agree on this information. Now, the Darley's team says that the court didn't follow this rule, and they argue that this hearing was important because it could have addressed their concerns about the accuracy of the actual trial record. And this matters because (laughs) the accuracy of this record is crucial for this appeal process, especially when it comes to a death penalty case. And Darley's team is asking for the case to be sent back to another court to handle this bill of exception. And overall, they're requesting that the conviction be overturned and a new trial be granted, or at least for the court, to order more hearings to address these issues. And that will do it. That is the end of the direct appeal by Darley's new attorney, J. Stephen Cooper. Now, in the next episode, we'll cover the state's response. And then the episode after that will be the defense response and then the court's opinion on whether or not to take up this appeal. Thank you so, so much for listening. If you find yourself coming back time and time again, consider subscribing to the podcast. If you're on YouTube, just click that subscribe button. It doesn't cost you a thing. And then if you want to be notified as soon as new episodes are released, just click the bell. Thank you all so, so much. We will talk really soon. Bye for now.